Welcome to the Julie Rose Show. Today is Tuesday, August 29th, 2017. Today, Eric and I have a topic that has um, been on my mind quite a bit the last several weeks, and so I'm going to turn the time over, welcome Eric, and have him introduce the topic today. Thanks, Julie. We've been talking a lot about signs in the heavens and Jewish holidays, and uh, but we've only touched on those topics just lightly, really. There's so much more that could be said. Um, Julie's been explaining to me that she's had some impressions, more impressions, even, even after what's been said, and she'd like to talk about that more. I want to just start by introducing the idea of Jewish traditions and holidays and so forth, and I'm not by any means an expert in these areas, but I wanted to say that I have studied Hebrew quite a bit, and um, I've really enjoyed learning the language and studying it, and I wanted to just share some of my enthusiasm with you about Jewish traditions and Hebrew, and uh, it's it's always so uplifting to me to research words, and the thing I love about Hebrew and Jewish traditions is everything has meaning. You can take just this the simple Hebrew alphabet, and each letter in that alphabet has significance and has meaning, unlike in the English alphabet, you know, a letter is simply just a letter. So I want to give a little example of, of why I love Hebrew so much. There's a great uh, word for truth, and a little historical sketch about the word truth in Hebrew. So, as I was saying, each letter has meaning. In, in Hebrew, the first letter is Aleph, which is A, and this letter has meaning. It's also the number one. It also means God. It means the beginning. It can mean past. Um, the middle letter of the alphabet is, is Mem, or M, and it means present. It has lots of meanings. All these words, letters have many meanings. The, the last letter in the alphabet is like our T, it's Tav. And so, so th that can mean things in the future. So if you combine the, the letter A, M, and T in Hebrew, it makes the word Amet. And now Amet is the word for truth. Truth we could define as things as they were things as they are and things as they will be. And so you can see how the combination of those three letters, the A, M, and T, things as they were, things as they are, things as they will be, how those letters came together and created this word. Everything has meaning. And to, to Jews and, and Israelites, even today, everything has meaning. Days have meaning. Um, and relationships and... Uh, these are the, this is what I love about Hebrew and Jewish culture. And so I love the way they celebrate. They have feasts for things. And, and I've noticed in our own culture, American culture especially, is our holidays are sort of geared towards, well, and I don't mean this in any disrespect, but we kind of self-aggrandize. We, we kind of uh, suit our <laughs> self-gratification. We... We gorge ourselves with cake and candy and all these things, but in Jewish and, and Hebrew Israeli culture, it's kind of the opposite. Holidays are are usually have a focus on God, and instead of turning inward, we they turn outward to celebrate things and um, and give back to the community and, and donate to charities and focus on their relationships with others and with God. And, and I, this is one of the things I love the very most about Jewish culture. And so, so with all that said, um, I, there are a number of holidays and other things that Julie and I will discuss a little today. And I'll turn the time back to you, Julie, and see what comes to your mind. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Eric. Yeah. Um, first, I want to let people know that I am by no means an expert in, in Jewish holiday or tradition. Um, I have been told and shown that I am um, an ancestor on, on the Davidic line of Jewish an ancestry from Judah, as well as um, going back to Joseph in the house of Ephraim. That is my lineage. 
so I think this is one of the reasons the Spirit's been prompting me to learn a little bit about the Jewish traditions and cultures and holidays, um, but also because it does tie in very specifically to my mission and to what we have going on in the universe right now, specifically related to um, the, the time of year that we're in, having just passed the solar eclipse on August 21st of 2017, and anticipating that we're going to have the planets aligning on September 23rd as we see the Book of Revelations written by John the Revelator coming into fulfillment um, from 2016 to 2017. So I wanted to start out with, with Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. And um, some of this I'm just going to be reading off of, of the Internet, different sources, mostly Wikipedia, which you guys can look up, and if you haven't, I encourage you to look up. Now, we know not everything's correct on Wikipedia, so if I get this wrong, that just shows my ignorance related to the Jewish traditions and holidays. But I'm doing the best I can to uh, follow the spirit on this and just at least give people a basic exposure, and then you can do your own research. Um, interestingly enough, just in the last week, we've had a few different emails come in from individuals who have listened to the podcast, and they themselves have put timelines and other things together of these holidays, and so we may be quoting from some of those as well. Um, for Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year, this is a season that's considered a time for repentance. And um, in, in Jewish tradition, they have specific prayers or penitential prayers, which are repentance prayers, that are called, I, I believe it's pronounced like the silicot, it's S-E-L-I-C-H-O-T, um, that are added to the daily prayers, except for on Shabbat. And so these prayers are done each weekday during what they call the month of, of um, is, it, is it Elul? E-L-U-L? Is that how you say it? Eric, it's, Eric's a lot better at, at Hebrew tradition. You know, it probably doesn't do matter too that? much how we say it, but I, I would probably say Elul. Elul. E-L-U-L. And, um, and so these prayers are, are recited, and um, on the eve of the first day, being the 29th, and Rosh Hashanah, the one to two, um, Tishrei or Tishrei, According to oral tradition, um, this is the head of the year, or the day of memorial or repentance, and the day of judgment um, that comes. So, so what they talk about in this tradition is that God appears in the role of a king, remembering and judging each person individually according to his or her deeds, and making the decree for each person for the following year. So this new year is just starting. We're looking at the end of last year, ending, which end of Jubilee, and then coming into a new year, with Yom Kippur being another holiday that will be recognized, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But Rosh Hashanah is a holiday characterized by um, one specific mitzvah and the blowing of the shofar. And a shofar is a, kind of like a type of horn, if you will. Um, and according to the Torah, which is the book of scripture used by the Jews, it's the first day of the seventh month of the calendar year, and they have their own calendar years. They don't go by by the um, the calendars that, that the rest of us use here in Western America. Um, this marks the beginning of a 10-day period leading up to Yom Kippur. So there's a 10-day period from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, and according to one of two of the Talmudic opinions, the creation of the world was completed on Rosh Hashanah. Um, so there's significance in that with the meaning um, as far as tradition goes, too. And they have morning prayer services. They, they talk about the, basically the majesty and judgments of God, remembrance, the, the birth of the world, and then the blowing of the shofar. And um, the, the Bible specifies that Rosh Hashanah as a one-day holiday, but it's traditionally celebrated two days, even within the land of Israel. And... Um, the Torah apparently does not use any term like New Year in reference to Rosh Hashanah. Um, it specifies four different New Year's days for different purposes, and the first one being, to, uh, I don't know how to say this either, a Tishrei, T-I-S-H-R-E-I, which is the conventional Rosh Hashanah or New Year for calculating calendar years or sabbatical year 
the Shemitah and the Jubilee, or the cycles and the age of the trees for purposes of Jewish law, and are for separating grains and tithes. This goes into the references we've made before about um, balances of scales and finances and other things that have to do on a, a grander scale with what's going on in the world and in the United States. Then, then um, the, the Shavat, or New Year for trees, and their current agricultural cycle that's related to tithes. So this also goes into play with agricultural, which can affect things on a spiritual level like famines and droughts. And then the, the Nisan, or Nisan, it's a N-I-S-A-N, New Year, for counting months and major festivals and for calculating the years of the reign of a Jewish king. And in biblical times, the day following 29 um, Adar, the year of the one of the reign of the king, would be followed by one Nisan or year two of the reign of the king or a certain individual. And in modern times, although the Jewish calendar year number changes on Rosh Hashanah, the months are still numbered from Nisan. So it gets a little bit confusing to those of us here in the West that don't, that don't follow this. There are three pilgrimage festivals that are um, always reckoned as coming in the order of Passover, and it's, um, uh, I don't have to say this either, Shabbat or Shabbat Sukkot, and it can have religious law consequences even in modern times, and the Elul, which is the New Year for animal ties. Um, so they talk about another one with the 10 days of repentance, and, and um, with the 10 days of repentance during that time, this is all in anticipation of Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippur is huge. It's an examination of, of one, so in these 10 days, they examine their deeds, and they repent for the sins that they've committed against God and other people, and it can take, this repentance can take on the form of additional supplication, confessing one's deeds before God, fasting, self-reflection, and an increase in involvement with or donations to charity. Um, do you have anything to say about that, Eric? Want to add anything? No, not necessarily. I think you're covering it really well. Okay. For Yom Kippur, which is which is considered Day of Atonement, um, that's that's the holiest day of the year for Jews, and its central theme is atonement and re reconciliation. This is accomplished through prayer and fasting, including abstinence from all food and drink, including water, by all healthy adults bathing, wearing of perfume or cologne, wearing of leather shoes, and sexual relations are some of the other prohibitions on Yom Kippur, and all of them are designed to ensure that, um, that the individual's attention is completely and absolutely focused on the quest for atonement with God. So Yom Kippur is also unique among holidays as having work-related restrictions, um, identical to those of Shabbat. And so the fast and other prohibitions commence on, on the 10th day at, sun at sunset, with sunset being the beginning of the day in Jewish tradition. So they, they reverse it. Sunset is their beginning of their day, and unlike our sunrise. And they have a traditional prayer um, that's traditionally recited just before sunset. And although it's often regarded as, as the start of Yom Kippur evening service, um, it's, it's technically a separate tradition. So... Um, so they recite this prayer at sunset, and then it's actually recited on the ninth day, which is the day before Yom Kippur, and it's not recited on Yom Kippur itself, which is the tenth day, which begins after sunset. Um, and, and you can look up more about that and the difference between those prayers and what they mean. They also have a four-cornered prayer shawl, which is, is worn for evening and afternoon prayers, the only day of the year in which this is done. And again, I encourage you to look up some of that tradition. Um, if you were to study it out in biblical times, there are references in the Bible regarding some of these these um, prayers and prayer shawls and things like that. So um, the services in all the traditions are the longest of the year on Yom Kippur. And in some traditional synagogues, prayers run continuously from morning until nightfall or nearly so. And their prayer of remembrance, they, they will quote, poems and other temple services um, that take place on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is so huge that basically uh, my understanding is at the end of Yom Kippur, then, then after that, um, it's understood that the judgments of God come. And so if one were to look at this from Western culture, we, we could, um, could basically say, okay, we've had 
we've had this eclipse. We're going to have the planets aligning. We're going to have Rosh Hashanah starting, and then Yom Kippur, which is is repentance hopefully being completed. And anything or anyone who has not repented at that point in time will suffer the judgments of God. Um, do you have anything to add on that? Nope, you're nailing it. Okay. <laughs> so Yom Kippur is considered, along with the 15th of Av, as the happiest days of the year. And I love that. I think it's amazing, right? A lot of people associate with repentance with something sad, like God is, is this you know, mean God who making people um, do what he wants. But I know and I testify that the atonement is for us and it's a gift and repentance is a gift of God for us. It helps lighten our hearts and it helps us turn to him as he carries our burdens. And that's really what repentance is about. So I love that they celebrate it in this manner. Um, the other thing is Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T, which is Feast of Booze or Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is also coming up. Now, in 2017, this is coming up in October, the first week of October. In 2018, this will actually occur the same week that these planets are aligning this year, between the 23rd and the 30th of September, will be Sukkot next year. And so that's significant as well. We, we will have the 14th anniversary of my NDE and significant changes next year during this week of Sukkot. Um, and <coughs> this, this specific holiday is a, is a seven-day festival, which is known also as the Feast of the Boobs, or Feast of Tabernacles, or just Tabernacles, and it's one of three pilgrimage festivals mentioned in the Bible. So this is huge. This goes back generations and generations. The Sukkot commemorates the years that the Jews spent in the desert on their way to the Promised Land, and celebrates the way in which God protected them under difficult desert conditions. The word Sukkot is the pearl of the Hebrew word Sukkah, meaning booth. Jews are commanded to dwell in booths during the holidays, and this, this usually means taking meals, some sleep in it, but, um, but not all of them, but especially in Israel, it, look, it looks like. And there's specific rules for construct, constructing those sukkah. And, and then it goes into some of the traditions there, which I have been shown, um, symbolically speaking, some of these. I did not realize on a conscious level that this was what sukkah was about, um, I was shown this in Dream and Vision, um, the significance of of palm leaves, willow, and, and what they call the citron, and that that goes into play with this holiday, and I just learned that in the last week and a half. Um, this is what it says related to that. It's a ritual, unique holiday, is, is, is the use of four species, the palm, the myrtle, the willow, and the citron or citron, and on each day of the holiday other than Shabbat, these are waved in association with the recitation of of, um, of H-A-L-L-E-L, -L -E -L, Hallel, in the synagogue, then walked in a procession around the synagogue called Hashanah. And on the seventh day of the Sukkot, it's called Hashanah Rabbah, the great Hashanah, singular of Hashanah, and the source of the English word Hosanna. And I think that's just amazing when we, when we get to the root word and then the root tradition of something like the Hosanna shout or even songs that are popular where we hear people praising Jesus Christ or praising the Lord with with the word Hosanna and that's um, representative of the palm the myrtle the willow and the, the citron and then they have different prayers and processions the tradition mimics practices from the uh, mimics practices from the temple in Jerusalem and many aspects of the customs also resemble those of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah, uh, Hashanah Rabbah is traditionally taken to be the day of delivery of the final judgment of the Yom Kippur and offers a last opportunity for pleas of repentance before the holiday season closes. And I find that interesting, too, that we have first Rosh Hashanah, which is the new year, then we have Yom Kippur, which is repentance, and then you have this other cot and and Hash, uh, the, Hash, the Hashan of Rabbah, which gives people an opportunity for a last opportunity to plead for repentance before the holiday closes and judgment comes. And um, I don't know, do you have anything to add about that? 
Eric? No, but um, can you can you bring it home for us now? Like you you've just mentioned a whole bunch of holidays then, and what does that mean? How does that overlay with our times? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is probably the same thing that everybody else is wondering is when is this earthquake in Utah going to happen? <laughs> right? right. So we're like we all feel it getting closer. None of us know exactly when it's going to come. Um, if we've got Yom Kippur coming, you know, in less than forty days now. And we have the planets aligning, fulfilling the book of Revelations coming on September 23rd. We have days of repentance and pleading, but we know through Revelation that the majority of the earth will not be repenting, and that therefore we know that judgment will come. And so um, I do know this, we are not having an earthquake before, the, before Yom Kippur finishes. After that, all bets are off. Um, people have asked me when the earthquake is. I said I don't know. I know when it's not, and I know it's not going to happen in September. But um, after that, I really don't know. I think it'll be interesting to find out how soon after we finish Yom Kippur we have that earthquake. Interesting. You know, Julie, there's in our culture, there's a lot of fear. We've talked a lot about fear energy surrounding signs in the heavens, and I think it's become sort of a taboo topic to talk about eclipses and things happening in the heavens. Right. um, Like you're some kind of weird mystic if you get involved in it, you know? Right, right. Like like the Bible talks about soothsayers, and there are cultures and religions that sort of base their their philosophies Uh upon things in the heavens. But I want to just point out how scriptural it really is. Um, Of course, the Hebrews, their calendar system was based off a lunar calendar, Mm-hmm. Um, here in the Gregorian, you know, in modern times, we base it off the sun mostly. And so um, and so that's why a lot of these eclipses that have happened in previous years have always fallen on Jewish holidays. I find that really interesting. Um, right. I think it's also worth mentioning just right there. You don't have to look farther than Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So the very mm-hmm. one of the very purposes that he created stars and things in the heavens was for signs. There are I agree. Yeah. There's a number of other scriptures um and I think it's important that we establish that we actually should be watching for the signs. I, I see in people's emails sometimes and comments that, you know, they'll say, I'm not trying to watch for signs or anything, but but here's the thing. We should be watching for signs. Um, Doctrine and Covenant section 88 says, And unto you it shall be given to know the signs of the times and the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 through 6. I just want to read this. It's a couple of verses long, uh, but worth reading. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Doctrine and Covenants 45 um, takes it further. It says, Even so it shall be in that day when they shall see all these things. Then shall they know that the hour is nigh. And it shall come to pass that he that feareth me shall be looking forth for the great day of the Lord to come, even for the signs of the coming of the Son of Man. And they shall see signs and wonders, for they shall be shown forth in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. There's just a few. Yeah, you're welcome. There's just a few scriptures that shed light on this need that we actually have to watch for the signs and that those things that happen in the heavens are an indication that the time is drawing near for the Son of God to come back to the world. That's excellent. I I appreciate you sharing that, Eric. Um, It brings my mind again to some of the signs and heavens that we're talking about here with the traditions and the book of Revelations. Um, I'd like to I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. Revelation twelve, 
Um, and I'm just going to quote a, a portion of that. We've done it before. I want to do it again with this. And then I'm going to give you just one interpretation. It's layered meaning. Now, I've come across different interpretations of Revelation 12, and I need to let you know that those on the other side of the veil have let me know that this, this interpretation of Revelations is just one of many. It's extremely layered, and there is more to it than this. But I want you to listen to what the Spirit tells you about this and see if you can pick up on the hidden meanings or the deeper meanings that are not just what I'm saying with my mouth, but what the Spirit's teaching you as we talk about both my mission and those of the those that have been foreordained to participate in the gathering. So Revelations 12, 1 through 2, And there appeared a great sign in heaven, in the likeness of things on the earth, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And the woman being with child cried, prevailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Um, so on September 23rd, there are going to be two constellations, Virgo and Leo, that are going to line up with Leo above Virgo. And normally, Leo only has nine stars, but on that night, Mercury, Mars, and Venus will roll in and line up with the other stars above Virgo, which will, which will present 12 stars, which is symbolic of, of the 12 stars around the crown. The moon will be at the feet of the constellation, and Virgo will be close to the sun. So the constellation Virgo, meaning the Virgin, the 12 stars represent, in one, in one meaning, the 12 stars represent the 12 tribes of Israel. It represents the Bride, or the Church of God, and the constellation Leo the Lion represents the tribe of Judah. Its brightest star is Regulus, which represents Christ, and it has nine stars until September 23rd, when Mercury, Mars, and Venus line up and move into constellation and make 12 stars. On this date, it is above the constellation of Virgo. I have been told specifically that my mission ties in directly to uh, this planet alignment, and... I'm not going to go into deeper meanings of what they've told me about about that, but I want you to just pay attention to that as time goes on, as you see more revealed both about my mission and the mission regarding the gathering and the Lord bringing his children home. In Revelation 12, again, it says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and his throne. Also that day... Um, on September 23rd, Jupiter, the king planet, will begin to move down between the legs of Virgo, where it has been since December 18th of 2016, around nine months. And then again in Revelation 12, it says, And there appeared another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was delivered, ready to devour her child after it was born. So um, so this is both symbolic and literal when we're talking about the woman in travail and in reference to the church and to what those, those stars represent, including the 12 tribes of Israel and the gathering. Um, my mission is directly tied to essentially being um, like a poster child for the gathering. And so I'm not going to go in, into more detail on that right now, but I want you to pay attention, study up, in the scriptures in Revelation 12, because we are seeing this kind of fulfillment as we speak. Um, Eric, do you have anything to add to that? I don't. I, but I think there's a lot on the internet um, concerning the constellations, the uh, everything you just described with the women and the way the stars are moving and things. I, I really do think that John the Revelator had full awareness of the constellations and the way those stars would move and i think he was describing those things literally i know that there are other symbol symbols as well in there and so like julie said it is layered there's a lot we can we can derive in reading these verses you right. know and, and there's that part where it spoke of the war in heaven and michael and the dragon and these things um you know, we often read that as a as a pre mortal experience, and it and it certainly was. Again, this is layered, but if you if you study that, you may find that there's actually meaning to the future as well. Again, one of those dual meanings. Yeah, I agree. When I was shown past, present, and future, and I've recently come out publicly letting letting people know on a podcast that I report to John. 
John the Revelator, who actually wrote the book of Revelations, it makes sense, doesn't it, that that is John, who is my distant ancestor, as I am a descendant on the Davidic line, and that they would assign John to oversee my mission, because essentially it's his mission. Right. And um, I'm just one of many people that will help him fulfill his mission as as John, and um, and as he wrote this book of Revelations, he he was shown past, present, and future, and then he wrote in a layered manner so that he was speaking both of past, present, and future, which is why it's so layered and it's difficult for, for a lot of people to get the meaning. Um, and so another, uh, so what's going on again in Revelation chapter 12, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score years. Um, Days. And after Christ's apostles in the ancient church were, were martyred, the church eventually went to apostasy, and the church of God was taken from the earth. The church of the devil was entrenched, and many plain and precious truths were taken from the Bible. And we're going to see that ha- happen again. So we will, um, there, will, there, will, there will be those who will apostatize from the church, there will be those who will be martyred, and there will be those who will then um, go as the remnant from the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and remnants of other seed that will come together with the tribes of Israel, bringing the 12 tribes of Israel back together to begin the Church of the Firstborn, as 144,000 are called and sent out to do missionary work. Um, Do you have anything to say about that, Eric? I think uh, verse 6 that you just read is interesting. And I've noticed this pattern in Scripture. Whenever you see this reference to... um, a thousand two hundred and three score days. If you do the math, that's three and a half years. You'll mm-hmm. there's an interesting tie into Daniel, who Daniel in the Old Testament, who spoke of the the desolation of abomination, and he he had two references, I believe, one in days and maybe it was months, and another reference was in weeks. But when you when you do the math, they end up being three and a half years as well. Um, Christ in Matthew tells us uh, he tells us about the day of abomination or desolation of abomination that Daniel spoke of and he referred to a time period of tribulation and when you put those two together that it's all these three and a half year time periods you know and anyway when you do the math and put those two two periods together you have seven years and so I think that's significant Um, Again, let me let me just restate that again that Christ tied it all together when he spoke of the the abomination of desolation which Daniel spoke of which is three and a half years and then he re- he said and there shall be great tribulation in those days which um, another uh, prophet and apostle somewhere in the scriptures said was also three and a half years so you have two three and a half year periods that comprise a seven year period and I think it's also interesting to note that the solar eclipse we just had could could very well, and I believe marks the beginning of that or close to the beginning of it, and then we'll have another solar eclipse in seven years. I find that, that fascinating. Something else I find fascinating when talking about math and as they've been trying to teach me about my mission, um, they've explained to me, um, essentially, I will be hidden up in the wilderness or will go to a gathering place in the mountains for three and a half years before I will experience a change in my body, and then the tribulations will continue um, till we reach the seven years. And so I, I find it interesting that, that um, the pattern of three and a half years even applies to my mission with what they're showing me. Whatever that mission is, I don't have a complete picture of it, but they are giving me more and more information, and I find it fascinating that there is spiritual significance to the to the three and a half years for many individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks for sharing that, Eric. I wanted to, to talk a little bit about what we have coming up in the world. Um, I've had a lot of people, I've been doing business meetings with GTRS and have, have made some good contacts and working on um, some of these funding issues with the documentary and and some other things that we're working on with GTRF, we're setting up a, an aviation company and some other things for rescue missions on human trafficking. And um, as as we do all of this in preparation for the tribulations and, and then going into the next um, decade or so, I'm absolutely fascinated with how the Lord is orchestrating this work. Um, you know, I'm a middle-aged mom from Kansas. I do have 
a, a decent resume on um, the business side as far as some of the things I've gone through and the Lord helping to prepare me. But by all accounts, I should not in any way be qualified to be doing some of what I'm doing other than that the Lord has qualified me and is qualifying all the individuals that I'm working with. I've been able to meet amazing people of every um, of every group that you can imagine. We have a lot of LDS people. We have people from various faiths across across the country. And I'm um, just amazed at the timing of things as they're coming together. I've been working for, for two years now on GTRF. I started it in August of 2015. And this month, um, the context that I've made and, and the work that we've been doing is starting to come and pay off and come to fruition. In September, we are going to be seeing some amazing things happening with GTRF, and I'm excited to make some of those announcements as, as those come to fruition. I, I know that the Lord is orchestrating this plan. I know that these holidays and these traditions are not coincidental when it comes to what's going on in the world right now. And I know that nothing's coincidental regarding what the Lord would have us to do to fulfill His promises that He's made to His children. He fulfills all of His promises, and He loves each and every one of us so much that He's giving us these signs in the heavens. He's giving us these um, different types of education from across cultures to help us get the communications um, out there to each other as we can warn and testify and help each other no matter where we are in the world. And and although I am not skilled or very educated in, in Jewish tradition or holiday, there are people that really are, and they've been sending me some amazing things, and I wanted to thank those who have been emailing me with information about this. It kind of helped give me clarity that, that, um, that we need to be paying more and more attention to this and tying in our research with what current presidents of the church, uh, prophets and apostles are saying in regards to being spiritually prepared, obeying the Sabbath day, continually preparing on a spiritual level. We can do all the preparations in the world on a physical level, but spiritually speaking, if we're not paying attention to the signs in the heavens, if we're not paying attention to what the Spirit is telling us, at the end of the day, none of the other stuff is going to matter. So um, with that, Eric, I just wanted to thank you for the time that we've had today. I encourage those that are listening to spread this message to others. Let them know that we have some big things coming up this fall. So we've got um, Yom Kippur, which whether we're Jewish or not, this applies to us as well because um, that's how the world works. And we have Day of Judgment coming very soon. Just wanted to spread my love to those who are listening and encourage you to do the same. Focus on the basics, focus on your family, and turn to God, because that's where safety comes. Eric, thank you so much for your time today. Julie, thank you. I appreciate your words. I'd like to just end on a final thought here. Um, I want to express my love for all those who may be listening who have Jewish connections or um, ancestry. Uh, you are children of Judah. You are of the house of Israel. You have a sacred role in the plan of salvation. I know God has his um, His watchful eye on you and your people. I want to read this this final thought from Moroni, a prophet in the Book of Mormon. In 3rd Nephi chapter 29, he said, speaking of latter days, he said, Yea, and ye need not any longer hiss nor spurn, nor make game of the Jews, nor any of the remnant of the house of Israel. For behold, the Lord remembereth his covenant unto them, and he will do unto them according to that which he hath sworn. And I leave that and my witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Eric, thank you. I love that scripture. I look forward to working more with my brothers and sisters across the globe, and I appreciate those who are listening today. Thank you for your faith. Thank you for your testimonies. Keep up the good work. Until next time.